Hi everyone. Uh, today I wanted to go over with you your option for drill number three, which will be comparing indigenous uh, traditions to Western traditions. I'm going to do a brief overview of both of those and some overlap between them. And then I'm going to be talking to you about a woman named Melvina Hoffman um, and the Hoffman bronzes from the Field Museum. And this will all be for uh, your first option for journal, for journal number three. I'll be doing another option next week. Um, and we'll be doing the same kind of process, which is compare and contrast. And then you use that to write up your 300 word reflection. Okay, so really quick here, I've got a Venn diagram going um, of indigenous traditions versus Western traditions, right? So we're gonna paint with some pretty broad stro strokes here, um, kind of start in this big high level, and then we'll narrow it down as we go on throughout this module. Um, but the indigenous traditions are basically, these are peoples um, who do not uh, adopt the Western tradition of the world and live in pretty traditional societies. And they're usually found in places like Africa, North America, South America, and Australia, and parts of Asia. Um, we call them the indigenous because these are the first peoples to live in those lands. Um, and if they maintain a tradition, we believe that they've maintained a lifestyle that may span for thousands of years, which largely remains kind of consistent. Uh, with with little little to little changes involved in that, right? So typically, and this isn't true for all indigenous groups, but typically indigenous groups uh, follow certain kinds of patterns. So a lot of them will have animistic belief systems. Um, animism is a form of belief that says that all things in the natural world have kind of a spirit or a life force behind it, and so that would include things like living things like animals and plants, but also things like rocks and mountains and natural forces, um, you know, the elements, things like, you know, winds, storms, fire, volcanoes, those kinds of things. There's obviously a lot of nature tied into animism. And so indigenous peoples tend to have a lot of natural um, focuses on their lifestyles. Uh, they're traditionalists, which means that they um, live kind of a, a steady lifestyle. It's a very stable lifestyle. It goes from, you know, from generation to generation, and it maintains kind of the same patterns and the same outlooks. There's a huge focus on collective and family. Um, we've got kinship groups become very, very important for indigenous folks. Uh, material belongings are usually passed down through kinships. Uh, leadership is passed on through kinship. Uh, and so there's a collective kind of focus as opposed to the individual focus that you find in Western traditions. Um, ethnobiology, ethnomathematics, and ethnophysics, um, these are ways of understanding the world and the universe around people, uh, but through kind of a traditional and generational knowledge, a knowledge that's passed on from, from the elders to the next group of people. Um, and there is a deep and rooted biology, uh, mathematics, and physics um, in a lot of these cultures, right? So you go to places like um, the Iroquois or the Yoruba um, or groups out of Australia, there are deep um, ethno biological and mathematical and physical ideas, right? So uh, for instance, things like the Bezier curve or the Bezier curve um, or uh, fractals had been discovered thousands of years ago by groups like out of the Native American tribes as well as out of the Aruba. Okay. Uh, cyclical time, we'll spend some more time about this next week, uh, but cyclical time is this idea that time is not from past, present to future, but time is repetitive and it goes through a, a cyclical process, um, and that there really is no difference between any of those three, past, present, or future, but that there is a blend of just existence that happens in a very cyclical way, or, or sometimes known as a wheel of time. Um, like I said before, there's a lot of stability and harmony here, um, and it's because of uh, elders being the core crux of the knowledge base. A lot of these groups don't write, they're, they're illiterate groups, um, so what their culture, their culture is embedded in the elders' knowledge. So that's very different from the Western traditions, right? So Western traditions are rooted in the Greco-Roman um, philosophy, history, and politics, right? So things like Plato and Aristotle, um, but also, um, you know, things that happen in, in, in um, like politically. So like the idea of a republic and a democracy, these are Greco-Roman. The Enlightenment period has a huge influence over uh, Western traditions, right? So even like the formation of our country, um, the idea of property rights, uh, the idea of, you know, what is ontology, what's epistemology, so what do we know and how do we know it? These are all typically rooted in the Enlightenment. And you can actually carry that into the Renaissance as well. So right, those two, those two time periods um, are very uh, influential on how Western traditions have developed over time. Judeo-Christian traditions play a big role in the West. 
Um, we talked a little about that in the last module. I would also throw in Islam, right? So Judeo-Christian Islam, because those three overlap so much. Uh, but we definitely have a Judeo-Christian kind of influence over a lot of our belief systems and our philosophies and the way our cultures are organized. Um, even the idea of like a patriarchy, for instance, can find its roots in Judeo-Christianity. There's a high emphasis on individualism in the West, right? So um, individual merits, um, you know, self-reliance, self-responsibility. There's a bigger push on that in the West than say like collectivism, which we see in things like the indigenous groups, but also in Eastern traditions, which we talked about in the last module. Um, scientific reasoning forms the core of a lot of what we believe and how we know the world. Um, if we didn't have science, we wouldn't have our technology, we wouldn't have our medical information, we wouldn't have um, computers. Like this is all rooted in the scientific um, methodology and the scientific experiments, right? We tend to believe in linear time, so past, present, and future. Um, this is linked to our science and our reasoning of cause and effect. This is linked to our experience of history. Um, so we tend to look at things in a very kind of strategic way or a, a, a way that is mapped out from past through present to the future. Um, we're progressive in that we tend to think of things as moving forward. Um, there is a price to progress. There is a price of being traditional, right? So uh, the, the price of traditionalism is that uh, you tend to not um, develop things like science and medicine in the same way that we would in the West. But the cost of progressivism is, is that, you know, um, there's a, an environmental cost, there's a social and emotional cost, right? There's a, there's a price to being progressive. And then obviously we have a huge emphasis on technology. In fact, Westerners tend to divide their world and then their history in a technological way, right? Starting back from like the Stone Age, going through the um, Iron Age and Bronze Ages, right? And then all the way up through the era of technology today, right? So like our conceptual age, our space age, our computer age, right? These ages are all based on our technology. We tend to map things in that way, okay? The overlap is, is that both groups have an ontology, right? Um, now the indigenous peoples might not call it that, but what is ontology? It's, it's what we know about the universe, or what is reality, those kinds of things, right? They both have an epistemology, a way of knowing the world, right? So in the West, we tend to look at things like scientific reasoning as a way um, or um, uh, the experience of things, so experiential, um, also um, empiricism, so like trying to, uh, and logic, these are the ways that we tend to see the world. In the indigenous cultures, it's usually it's framed through nature, through traditions, uh, through rituals, and through like the collective. Um, both groups are trying to answer essential questions. So like, why are we here? Is there a God? If there is a God, what's that God's purpose? What's that God like? Um, what happens after we die? What's the meaning of life? What's the purpose of humans, right? So they both are addressing those essential questions. Um, they both have a constructed reality. Right, so the West constructs a reality based on how we know things. Uh, the indigenous groups construct a reality based on their world around them. And lastly, both groups um, are, are uh, expressive. They, they, their forms of expression help typify their culture, right? So the styles, the media, um, the type of arts that, that cultures engage in, these help define um, their, their culture themselves, right? So their forms of expression um, have some overlap sometimes, um, or it can be very different stylistically, right? So these are the major kind of broad strokes that separate indigenous groups from Western groups. Now, like I said, there was a price. There's a price to having these groups and these groups uh, meet. If you think back to our first model, we talked about how different tribes collide and different tribes have to either assimilate or reject one another um, the, these two groups tend to meet in certain ways throughout our history, especially if you look at modern history, uh, stemming back to like, say, like the age of discovery or the age of sail, right? The Westerners tend to be the conquerors of these people. And again, going back to module one, um, if you think about Jared Diamond's theories about geographic luck, he explains that as this group being able to conquer this group largely because of things like germs and then later guns and steel. Okay, so that's the interaction between these groups. Now, how that plays out um, can be different depending on the culture, depending on the time period. But one of the things I wanted to focus on was this work by Malvina Hoffman, uh, because not only is this a more recent time, so this would be happening in the 1900s, um, but it illustrates the issue when Westerners collide with the indigenous groups. All right, so for, um, for this journal, you can go broad strokes and narrow it in on, into 
uh, these works by Malvina Hoffman. So I'm gonna go ahead and share this with you. Okay. So um, Malvina Hoffman um, was an artist. She studied under Auguste Rodin, um, who's most famous for the thinker. I'm sure you've seen that sculpture before. Uh, and what she did was she created these busts, these, these human busts um, from all over the world. And she was instructed to do so by the Field Museum right here in Chicago. And she ended up creating this exhibit, um, which by today's standards would be highly polarizing and highly racist. And it's because of how Westerners interacted with the indigenous peoples of that time. This is the early 1900s, and this is gonna be, um, her, her travels are gonna be through the 1920s, and she's gonna end up doing her, finishing her exhibit, or the design of her exhibit in the 1930s. And that exhibit's gonna last in the Field Museum all over the 1960s after the civil rights movement, it's taken down. Now in recent history, uh, just a few years ago, the Field Museum actually brought back this exhibit, um, but not in its original form as a critique of its original form. Because you have to understand what the Field Museum is, right? This is an institution, a, a world famous institution of um, knowledge, science, and natural history, right? People flock from all over the planet to research at the Field Museum. And so for 30 some years, it promoted a highly racially charged view of the world, right? A constructed reality of the world. Because of that, um, it spread this kind of racist science pretty pervasively. And so Hoffman was actually pretty critical of this, even in the beginning, um, but you have to understand who she was. Uh, and at the time, like it was pretty rare for a woman to have been assigned such a prestigious role. Um, and so she took on this role, but she, she actually wrote a whole diary about this, like kind of questioning some of the things that she did, especially when they would do things like she would send in a bronze statue of a person where she sculpted this meticulously of the person, and then they would reject it, send it back to her and say, well, it didn't look African enough, or it didn't look Asian enough. Continue to model this. And she, you know, she was frustrated by this because you know, the idea is that, well, she, she sculpted an actual person. So um, I'm gonna link this quick video here. That's a four minute video that is actually shown at the Field Museum. And it talks uh, in greater depth about the Malvina bronzes or the Hoffman bronzes um, and why they're so kind of important to the Field Museum's history. Your goal then is to try to understand the perspectives of seeing one of these bronzes in real life, okay? So there's lots of perspectives you can kind of look at. You can look at it from a, a Western point of view. You can look at it from an indigenous point of view. You can look at it from Malvina Hoffman's, the scientists at the Field Museum, um, children visiting the museum from the 30s to the 60s, uh, people who would be what we would call racist today viewing that, people who were of those races that were being oppressed viewing that. So there's lots of viewpoints to kind of take on and imagine what it would be like to view this exhibit. And so I'm not gonna um, show the whole video, but I just wanna show you kind of the introduction to it. Um, the idea. Okay, so this is how this video plays. Um, it gives you kind of a history of it, and then it'll do a nice comparison to, to, to ideas today. So I'll link this video as well, um, and then you can go ahead and take a look at it. It's only four minutes. And then your goal for the journal is to compare and contrast Western traditions and Western viewpoints to indigenous viewpoints. But I'd like you to consider the Malvina Hoffman bronzes specifically and think about different types of people who would view these bronzes and how they would kind of react in these groups and then do a true compare and contrast, compare the differences um, and compare the, and the similarities and what overlaps and what is different from there. All right, so um, this will be your option for journal number one. Um, the way we used to do it in class was I'd have you do this as a group and discuss this. Unfortunately, because of the circumstances we find ourselves in, we're gonna be doing this individually, but by all means, feel free to reach out to me with questions or reach out to your peers and have discussions about this. Um, I, it's one of my favorite things to discuss. The other thing is, if you want to, go ahead and go to the Field Museum and you can virtually look at this exhibit. Um, and if you do so and do kind of like part of that into your reflection, I'll give you a little, a little extra credit as well.
All right. So this is option one for journal three. It's a compare and contrast of indigenous traditions to Western traditions framed by the Malvina Hoffman bronzes. Um, and then next week we'll be doing a different one for another option. All right, guys, thank you so much. Good luck on your journal and I'll be talking to you soon.